Great. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Hope you guys are are here for the long haul. This is uh this is hour ten of the Tamron Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few more to go. <laughs> Just a few more to go. No, uh, but uh, I like to uh, thank for seriously. Thank you all for uh, for attending. I appreciate it. I hope you guys will enjoy it. For those of you who saw Ken's last one, uh, Mysteries of Night Photography. Uh, which I thought was pretty cool. I hope you guys will enjoy this one. It's using long lenses uh, to capture birds in flight. I'm assuming most of you like birds here, so I think you're probably in the right spot as far as that goes. Um, there's a couple of things going on, just to keep you an idea. Um, oh, no, my God. Her, her, Jill's going to be doing the up close and uh, uh, with macro, I believe, in the next couple of weeks. So if you guys are interested in it, I love the title, by the way. Up close with my macro. Up close with my macro. So I think that's going to be really cool. So if you guys are interested in that, don't forget to sign up for that as well, too. Um, hopefully, we'll be streaming on YouTube at that point as well. So we'll go with that. Uh, for those who don't know, the store is back open. If you hadn't known yet, uh, it's normal operating hours, 10 to 6, Monday through Friday, 10 to 2 Saturday. Hence the, hence the virtual screen behind me. Yeah. Uh, if you guys lose this information, I'll try to find the link for the video that's streaming live. Uh, apparently, I've lost it, so it's not showing up on my page. But uh, if you got, if, uh, but if anyone sees the link, just post it in the message board. I'd appreciate that. But uh, if you happen to lose it, uh, you, I'll keep an eye on the admin thing. If everyone, please just keep all your microphones off. In fact, I'm, anybody who's, I'm going to click mute all for just a second. And then and make sure that all the hosts are doing that. And uh, everyone should, you know, all the hosts should be okay at this point. Uh, all right. Oops, nope. I am unmute. Oh. Oh. Unmute. All right, guys. Now, technically, you should be able to unmute yourselves, I think. Come on. Yep. I think I'm good. All right, there you go, Jeff. So, but, but, but the idea is we don't want to hear any ambient background noises like cats meowing. <laughs> Spouses yelling, kids shouting, ambulance coming by, you know, stuff like that, you know. But, uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Oops, here's another one. Name it them. Let me see what else. I think that's about it. I think that's all the uh, – is there anything else I'm missing, guys? Oh, yeah, the uh, uh, Tamron's new lens. I almost forgot oh. about that. Yeah, Tamron. For all you Sony shooters out there, Tamron, and I'll let, I'll let Kim talk about it a little bit too, is that they got that 28 to 200 uh, for the Sony FE mount with a 2.8. Yep. Aperture rain, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, we're taking pre-orders now. We're hoping for availability by sometime by the end of uh, June, as if I understand correctly, depending mm -hmm. upon whatever is out there in the world. The but, um, the on sale date is June twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. So you should have them just before then. Okay, the great. Store. All right, so great, Grace. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. There's going to be an online demo, as it were, on Monday. So if you're a Sony shooter and you're looking for that all-in-one lens to fulfill your needs, this will be a good lens to check out. Uh, I think it's what uh, what's the retail seven forty nine? I forget off the top seven twenty nine something like that. So this will be a good, good yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for listening to me uh, pontificate. I'll try to keep an eye on the questions. If you got a question, make sure you post it there in the chat, and we'll try to make sure we can chime in. Jeff will keep an eye on it. Jeff is uh, he's the Tam, he's the Tam JV handle that you see there. Ken is the Ken Hub nineteen sixty nine. Uh, you can you can post it to us privately or post it to us publicly. But keep in mind, Ken might be busy, may miss those messages. So Jeff yeah. or me, the guys are going to be kicking the keeping the questions in play as far as that goes. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right, Ken, thank you very much. Jeff, thank you. And uh, again, thank you all for coming again tonight. Jeff, did you want to say something quick? Or? Um, no, uh, just to thank you and thank Don, uh, Dono for taking care of all this. And, and just to add to the, um, to the um, webinar on Monday, it will not only include the new lens from Sony, but it kind of gives an overall picture of the Sony um, family from Tamron. Great, cool. All right, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Let's see, that should work. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and my video, turn my video off so that it doesn't jump around.
All right. And everybody should see this bird flying into our laps right about now. So hopefully everybody can see that. And Jeff, just noted for you, in case there's any technical difficulties, I do keep my cell phone right in front of me. So if okay. I don't see something happening, just uh, text me and say, hey, stop for a second. We're having a slight technical difficulty. You got it. Um, I want to thank Johnson Fo Johnson's Photo Imaging uh, for hosting this event once again. Like Dono said, yeah, I did a Night Skies uh, webinar earlier, and now we're going to talk about tips and techniques for bird photography. Yep, I'm going to definitely go over birds in flight, but since... Some of you, I don't know the skill set of everyone that joins in on these events. I kind of cover birds in general and techniques like that and cover uh, bird in flight along with it. This guy, this guy's a peregrine falcon and he actually lives out in Jackson, Wyoming. And I like to tell the stories of some of them, some of the images, because this one's kind of interesting. They found him when he was really, really young. Um, but he never would fly. He never wanted to take off. They weren't sure exactly what was wrong with him until they did an eye test on him. He didn't want to fly because he was had extremely bad eyesight. So over the years, they actually taught him how to fly and fly better. And the reason he, you can tell, he's really, really concentrating on his landing post, but he's an incredibly a uh, beautiful bird, especially underneath those wings. Those feathers are just just tremendous and a very impressive bird to see uh, flying like that. And I do love going to these rescue centers wherever I go because, you know, for the most part, a lot of them do an incredible job of raising these birds and either getting them back to the wild or if necessary, like him, he'll never be able to be on the wild on his own. So they keep him for life and they make him very happy feeding them and, and doing all of those great things. My name is Ken Hubbard. I am with Tamron USA. Um, I've been with them about 20 years. I'm the field service manager, which means I have a team that we go around the country teaching classes, seminars, workshops, you name it, uh, during normal times. <laughs> but during these times, we're having just as much fun teaching all of you all these different webinars that we've come up with all over, over the months. So. Hopefully you're getting a lot of good information from them, inspiring you to now that things are opening up again to get out there shooting. And I know Florida has such great locations uh, to do birding photography. There's a ton of them. There'll be some images from Florida in this presentation. So thank you again for joining along and I hope you're all doing well. Some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about today is knowing and controlling your camera settings. Um, with birding photography, it can be frustrating enough trying to capture that bird in flight. Just getting it in the frame can be frustrating enough, let alone dealing with all the different camera controls. So get to know your camera, understand it as well as you can before even going out and trying to do this. Understand the, everything that goes on with it, where everything is. Um, really dissecting it because with birds and birds in flight, things happen so quickly, you don't have time to break out that manual and say, wait, where a second is IO servo and where, so it just doesn't happen. You're gonna miss your images. Bring the right equipment. Uh, like most photography, having the right stuff at the right time will increase those chances tremendously to get that image you want. Do your research and understand your subject. Birds, like people, have habits, and they come to places and leave places. They land certain ways in certain places, so really do your research. And ultimately, it comes down to practice, practice, practice. Um, really getting out there, even if you have a local zoo or a local recovery center like uh, the Peregrine Falcon and the Tetons, get out there and shoot. It's not, it's not bad to go out there. You can capture some amazing images. Just go into your local zoo or a local place like that. It's a numbers game. This is not a type of photography that you, will, you, need, that you should get upset about shooting a thousand images or 2000 images in a day and only walking away with say 20, 25. You do have to shoot a lot to get just a few great images. It's the nature of the beast with this one. 
look for the good light, like any type of photography. The better the light, a lot of times, the better the image. So look for good light. Keep those eyes sharp. You want to keep that contact between your viewer of your image and the image itself. And keeping those eyes sharp, just like with people or whatever type of animal you're shooting, will help that viewer keep in contact with your image and the subject within that image. Composition, direction, and movement. Just like any type of photography, really, really helps. But there is definitely some things to help increase that composition to make it better. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. If you see me looking outside a couple of times, it got really, really dark out there. So I got a feeling a storm's coming, but we should be okay. Uh, know and control your camera and its settings. Control the shutter, aperture, and ISO. Not only just for proper exposure, but to get the image you're looking for. Understand your metering modes in your camera and how to best have your camera read the, what is a proper exposure. Pick the correct shooting mode. What do you want to shoot in? Aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, whatever it may be. The correct mode that will help you capture the best images. So understanding your controls, controlling your shutter speed. For the most part, when you're talking about birds in flight, it is all about that shutter speed. You have to control it, <laughs> and it has to be on the faster side. Um, for the most part, you're not going to be shooting at a 60th second, not even at 1 25th a second. You're talking shutter speeds of, say, maybe 1,000, 1,600, 2,000. And the reasoning why is that shutter speed is so fast that it freezes the action and you get the full expansion of the wings and all that. The slower it goes, you're going to get wing blur or motion blur in the body of the bird. So it is, if you're looking for, and is that what you're trying to do, capture that bird in flight sharp, very fast shutter speeds. Just like here, um, controlling that shutter speed to freeze mo uh, mo movement. These are Sandhill Cranes in Bastel Apache, New Mexico. Uh, they have a festival every November down there and an intensive in January. That's a pretty, pretty cool event. These Sandhill Cranes are a bit of a goofy bird, if you ask me. Their landing, you see this guy over on the right-hand side over here. If you can see my cursor moving and circling, yeah, wings are kind of awkward. They're knock-kneed and all that, but they're actually a pretty cool bird to photograph. Um, a lot of character in them. They're, they squawk and do all this other stuff. But because I wanted to capture him, them coming in and freeze their wings as they're landing, I was at one two thousandth of a second to do that. But Basel Apache doesn't just have sandhill cranes, it has snow geese as well. And the snow geese come in before sunset, but before sunrise, sorry about that. And what they do is they'll come in in waves and they'll land in lakes. And just as the sun rises over the horizon, literally breaks that horizon, they start making a ton of noise and they all fly off at once. Unfortunately, a lot of times, the amount of light you have to work with it doesn't really allow you to get that one two thousandth of a second. And if you can, there's so many that it creates this mass amount of white. So when I was there one time, I was thinking about an image I saw uh, many years back in National Geographic of something like 50,000 flamingos taking off at once in Africa by a famous photographer, but he did it at a slow shutter speed. He tried something a little bit different to create an interesting image. Instead of just having all these very sharp pink flamingos, he did it very slow. And he had this incredible blur. So I did the same thing on another morning in Bastel Apache, I'm at 1 15th of a second here, right as a mass of about 10,000 snow geese go up at once. And I purposely chose this particular image because they're all pretty much above that horizon line of the water where you can see the 1 15th of a second, which fast enough to keep these sandals cranes, they're standing pretty still, sharp, and the water sharp, but as these geese are flying up, they're blurry. Now, to me, if they were all sharp, your eye would be just bouncing around all over the place and can't really concentrate on anything. This one is a little easier to focus on and recognize because they're a softer thing. So if conditions aren't perfect when you're out there going for birds in flight, 
go for something slightly different or, or think of ways to capture images. I'm going to show another image later on that does the same thing under a really, really low light. So controlling your aperture. We all know the smaller that number, f2.8, the more opening, more light comes in, the faster your shutter speed can be. So using your aperture to get that shutter speed up is helpful. Under low light, you're going to open it up, let more light in, allow you to get that faster shutter speed. But as you have brighter, brighter light, you can stop down. And what do you get when you stop down? You get larger depth of field. So in a case like this, I'll use my aperture when I have a bird, and this is a bald eagle in Alaska, that for whatever reason, he was really frisky. He was moving about, and you normally, when you see um, uh, bald eagles in trees, they can sit there for hours and literally not move. They'll stare out into something and just stare at it for hours. But this guy must have seen something somewhere. So he was bouncing from branch to branch, I did stop down my aperture, even though it's overcast, because of his movement. Because he was moving from branch to branch so much, I wanted to make sure I had enough depth of field that if I missed my focus by a little bit and maybe hit the tip of his wing or the back of his body with my focus point, that I, I had enough depth of field to keep that eye sharp. So it, it really depends on the situation of what I'm looking at of what depth of field. Do I need the light? I'll open up that aperture. Do I need a little bit more depth of field because there's some movement going on? I'll stop down and give myself a little bit more depth of field. The third part of controlling all three, uh, all, all two of the previous is the ISO. For me, the first thing I think about with birds and birds in flight is shutter speed. That's the very first thing I'm thinking about, is what am I trying to do? Am I freezing it, or is a little bit of motion, uh, of motion blur in the image okay? So I'll set my shutter speed. Next is, if I'm you know, not really dealing with a bird that's moving too much and I can have a shallower depth of field, maybe I open up that aperture. But if it is a bird that's moving a lot, I'm stopping down that aperture. And the third aspect to control it after I've set both of those is my ISO. That's the third thing I think about to compensate for the other two and make sure I have that proper exposure. And understanding ISO that going from 100 to 200, as the numbers go up, it's more sensitive, the sensor is more sensitive, which means you can have a faster shutter speed because the more sensitive your sensor is the, to light, the faster that shutter speed, the less light you need hitting it. So going from 100 to 200, doubling that sensitivity, 200 to 400, doubling it again, 400 to 800, doubling it again. So there may be times I'm shooting at 800 ISO or 1600 ISO to capture that bird in flight. But in the middle of the day, something like this, this uh, Osprey that was flying around, middle of the day, 200 ISO, no problem, can shoot at f6.3 because he's up, down, around, giving myself maybe even f8, giving myself a little bit more depth of field uh, is perfectly fine. And my shutter speed is easily at one two thousandth of a second at that point. Hey, hey Ken. Yeah. Yeah, Candice was asking, do you, are you using shutter priority or full manual? All right. The getting ahead of me, which is okay. And I, I primarily shoot in manual, and that's just because of doing it all the time. Um, there will be times that I will shoot in shutter priority if I'm moving, say, from a different scene to a different scene to a different scene. Maybe I'll throw my camera into shutter priority, but more often than not, I'm shooting in manual. For people just getting into it, um, and this will go into the next few sections. Just getting into it, I recommend doing shutter priority. Figure out what it is you're trying to do, and then set the shutter speed accordingly. Am I trying to capture a bird in flight? Fast shutter speed, one two thousandth of a second? Or am I okay if there's a little blur in the wings? Maybe you can go to 800. So that'll allow you, because the camera will then adjust the aperture and depending on what you do, you can have the camera do auto ISO. And I'm going to get into that in a second. So anybody starting out, I recommend shutter priority or time valuative in Canon. Uh, if you're experienced in it and you're comfortable, manual works well as well. Just 
you know, realize you might go from bright areas to dark areas and you're gonna have to make adjustments on the fly. So like here, uh, controlling your ISO, even though this bird, this great blue heron is hanging out, and this is in Florida, near the Space Coast, um, Vera, the Vera wetlands. He was hanging out and, and he was just sitting there as the sun was setting beautiful light on him, but I had set my ISO to 800 ISO, my aperture to about f6.3, so he's nice and focused. The, the tree in the back of him is out of focus, but it drops out relatively quickly after that. But what that did is allow me to shoot still at one two thousandth of a second. And you're like, well, the bird's just standing there in the water. Why are you shooting at one two thousandth of a second? I'm always prepared for when that bird might take off because that's a great action shot. If he suddenly decides to take off and fly while over in this water, can make a great image. So I'm ready, I'm exposing for him to take off. My shutter speed is getting set to take off. Now going back to shooting in manual and or shooting in time variative or shutter priority, there's something called auto ISO. And for those of you that are just beginning with birds in flight, this is a great asset to have. When you're shooting in a scene that, and I show this because you see the top of the scene is bright, the middle of the scene is dark again, and the foreground is light again. So this brown pelican, and this was Apalachicola, Florida, it, he went from highlights, then dove into those shadows, and then came out into those highlights again. If you're in manual and you're shooting at a shutter speed and aperture and ISO set for this particular scene where he's in the highlight, when he dives into those shadows, he's going to be really, really dark. He's going to be muddy and dark. What auto ISO allows you to do is that you can control the ISO to go from 100 to say 1600, 2000, 3200, whatever you're comfortable with. You can give it a parameter to fluctuate automatically to keep your exposure proper. So if you're not quick enough to change something on the fly, you can let auto ISO do it. It's, it's nice. I know um, in certain scenes, I'm not fast enough to change an exposure that quickly. So if I know I'm in very contrasty scenes, yeah, I'll go to auto ISO and let it fluctuate a bit. To, um, to capture the proper exposure. So don't be afraid to use, don't be afraid to use what the camera gives you. You know, you might get teachers out there that says, oh, I only shoot manual, just deal with it. And that's the way you should shoot. Ah, you know, maybe, but if the camera gives you something that allows you to capture that image better right now, where you are in your photographic career, use it, you know? You know, ultimately, it will help you progress a little bit faster. Why? Because you're not going to get so frustrated. And that's the key. Always enjoying photography. Don't get frustrated with it. This is hard enough just to frame a bird. So um, just have fun with it. Always, always stay positive with your photography. Hey, hey Kevin? Yep. Ken, I'm sorry, Ken. Uh, Kevin's got a question. He wants to know if these shots were handheld or monopod, tripod. <laughs> you guys are good. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go into this later as well, but, you know, it's, it really depends uh, on the type of birds that I'm shooting. If I have a, a bird like an osprey, I'll go back to this guy, I'm usually handheld, especially in the middle of the day when they're, they're going fishing, because it's a little bit easier. The movements on an osprey are very quick. And if I'm on a monopod with even with a, um, uh, an L bracket a gimbal head, for me, I'm not that fast on a gimbal head that I can keep up with him. So I'll be handheld. If I'm doing panning shots of birds landing, like the Osprey's landing, I'll definitely be on my tripod with that gim gimbal head. Sorry. Gimbal head because it, it really helps me. It, it really helps me keep a nice, smooth, even pan. Even if they're coming in at an angle and angling down more, it allows for it. So it depends on the type of bird that I'm shooting in the situation, so. All right. Yeah, it's pouring now out there, so. You know, I very rarely lose any electricity, so we should be good. Knock on wood, I don't have any, but <laughs> sorry about that. Metering modes, metering modes, you have matrix evaluative, center weighted, 
and Spot. I'm going to talk about most of those three. Matrix takes 95% of your viewfinder, takes the highlights, the shadows, uh, the midtones, evaluates it all, comes up with a proper exposure. Center weighted looks at the you know the 95% or entire viewfinder or what's in the viewfinder, looks at it, but weights 30%. And some of the cameras now you can even adjust that here and there to use a little bit more puts most of it on that 30% that you want to meter off of. Spot's very specific. It literally is a spot. So when you're dealing with a bird in flight, spot metering can be a little bit tough to be like, ooh, I'm gonna spot meter off that bird. And this, this bald eagle, which was in the tree earlier that you saw, decided to finally take off. And you're metering now because I, that sky and everything in the background and you hit right here underneath the wing and try to meter off that guess what you're going to get an overexposed image because that is good it's going to try to turn it to um, with digital cameras now 12 percent gray where it used to be 18 percent gray that's not 18 percent gray that is pretty dark shadows so if it turns it to that guess what happens everything else is overexposed or if you spot meter and hit this cloud up here, or even the cloud underneath the head of this bird, that's brighter than 18% gray. So it's gonna underexpose because it it's gonna wanna turn that to that percentage. So it's gonna underexpose everything. Unless you hit something that's perfectly at that 18%, then you get a little questionable. I tend to use, the reason why I use center weighted is because this center part, like I said, hopefully you see my cursor, is roughly 30% of the frame and the most important part of the frame. What it'll do is take some of these highlights, take some of these shadows over here, take his head, take the shadows on the wings, the, the density of the back feathers, the tail feathers, and evaluate it and give me the proper exposure for this area. So that's where when I shoot animals, and birds in flight, I tend to be a little bit more center weighted. Matrix works better every year and every version of it that it comes out, but because there's so much brightness here, it may see that and weight a little bit too brightness and underexpose it. So, you know what, it, ultimately with anything, it's always best to listen to tons of people because somebody might have a tick or te tip or technique that you're just like, you know what, I relate to that a little bit better and I like that idea a little bit better. Um, so you end up finding what works for you uh, as well. But um, for me, like I said, center weighted usually works great uh, when I'm doing birds in flight or animals. Camera settings, like we went into the question before, what are my camera settings? I shoot more in manual than anything else. But with animals and especially birds in flight, I will resort to one. Uh, go back to one and that'll be shutter priority because the most important thing with birds and birds in flight is shutter speed. The camera I set the shutter priority because that's the most important thing. Let the camera deal with aperture, let the camera, you know, I'll set my ISO or I'll put it in auto ISO and go from there. Aperture priority what will happen is, you know, that's more for landscapes where you're dealing, you want large depth of field or shallow depth of field. What's more important for you? Program the camera's doing everything. It's gonna, it's setting itself for a proper exposure. You're not gonna know what it's gonna pick. It's just saying, I'm gonna get a proper exposure for you. You can compensate, concentrate on composition. That's fine too, but chances are your shutter speed just won't be right. The one thing to watch out for, if you're in shutter priority and not shooting in um, auto ISO, be careful that you set a shutter speed and you look and you go for you know where the birds are going to be. If you see your aperture blinking, that means it can't get enough light. And you're going to have to adjust your ISO or put your ISO in auto ISO so it'll let it compensate for it. Whenever you see one or the other aperture blinking in shutter priority or the shutter speed blinking, you know, there's something it, it, it can't get enough or has too much light. So pay, pay attention to that when you're using one of these priority modes or AV or TV modes. Here, this is easy manual. This is a great time to practice. This guy, like I said, eagles can stand there for hours on end just on a branch hanging out. 
Uh, this is, like I said, practice what, either at zoos or birds that are not moving too often in manual. Get used to it. Open and close that aperture. Uh, speed up, slow down that shutter speed because ultimately, like I'm going to say later, is practice is what's going to make you better at it. This guy literally, he was sitting there uh, when we drove by in Apalachicola and we shot him for about 15, 20 minutes, went to lunch. I was with David Akubian um, and went to lunch, came back. He's still standing exactly the same position, looking the same direction. Pretty amazing and never looks happy. He's just, he's one angry bird, it looks like, you know. But this guy, um, because the light was very consistent with them taking off, I'm in manual. I did a couple of test shots for exposure off of knowing I want one two thousandth of a shutter speed. Did a couple of test shots while they sat in the water. You know, one two thousandth, F uh, 6.3, at an ISO probably of 200 or 400 in this case. Did a couple of test shots and then just waited for him to take off. And this is, again, a, an image where a gimbal head works great because you can focus on them just sitting in the water and slowly move as they paddle by and be ready with that gimbal head and taking the weight off the camera system. So you can just hang out for a while, for as long as you want, and wait for them. And as they start taking off, it allows you to pan nice and easily with them firing all the way as they, they take off. And the reason why I picked this one is I like the wings extended fully forward and just tipping the water and this little bit of splash in the background. More camera settings, continuous focus or in Canon AI servo and continuous shooting modes. Continuous focus and AI servo, uh, continuous focus is Nikon, AI servo is Canon is when you lock on focus and then the camera and lens, as long as you keep your finger on the, the shutter or if you're using back button focus, I'll go into that in a second, as long as you hold it, it will refocus as the animal or the bird goes through and moves closer to you, away from you, across you, it'll just continue focusing. This is a must when doing bird and photography. This will increase your amount of in focus images tremendously because if you try to do single shot up down up down up down you're going to miss almost every single time <laughs> and continuous shot sh continuous shooting modes is all is when you press that shutter and the camera continues to fire off that shutter so if your camera has two modes continuous low or continuous high i highly recommend high the more frames you can shoot per second the better. Uh, it just allows for uh, a better chance of getting that image you're looking for. Like this guy, this guy was hanging out in the tree and we're, we're still waiting for him, waiting for him, waiting for him. And the minute I saw his wings start to flap, I started shooting. I probably shot off 20 to 25 straight shots in a row. Um, I'm going to deviate for a second. I would go to Johnson Photo and get the fastest right card you can get, be it SD, X, XQD, whatever it is. For this type of photography, a fast writing card is important because you don't want to hit that buffer mode too, that buffer too quickly. And the faster the card you have, the more you can shoot off before it'll have to buffer again. So I shot 25 shots in a row and ended up getting two in that sequence that I really, really liked. Just taking off while he's still in between the trees and another one you'll see later on. Um, just shooting straight, straight through it. And having that AI servo and, con and uh, continuous focus allowed me, as he moved around, every single one in focus as he moved. Hey, uh, Ken. Yep. Linda was asking for a little bit further explanation of continuous focus. You know, how do you do it? You know, I'm assuming it's different for every camera for the setup. But, right. uh, but it, I, I would imagine that she what she's asking is... Uh, you know, for her particular camera is what she's looking for. And yeah, if, if she has a particular camera, she can email me uh, afterwards and we can get into it because chances are that's going to take up a little bit of time to go through. And if I don't know exactly the camera she has, it may take me a few minutes to think about where it may be. Yeah. And um, if Linda, if you want to, you can always stop. By, I know you were here not too long ago, so you can always stop by. Oh, okay, and check it out. Yeah. Perfect. That's even better. Yeah, and, and 
<laughs> and the other thing too is uh, they're asking if you shoot in raw versus JPEG. What do you prefer? I shoot. I shoot in raw. Um, every single image in every single presentation that you see has work done to it. Um, and by shooting in raw allows me the flexibility to correct and adjust or change images without too much. It's non-destructive when you shoot in raw. In JPEG, the simplest movements of exposure or color are destructive to the image as in it degrades it to whatever degree. So I, I recommend shooting in raw. I fully understand that people don't want to deal with it or don't know how to adjust uh, in raw. I, I still, if you can, still shoot in raw because you never know one day you may want to go back and you may learn how to shoot in raw, uh, to adjust in raw. So it doesn't hurt. It just takes up space, a little space on a hard drive. So, all right. Bring the right equipment. Lenses, tripods, monopods, gimbal heads. Uh, that's why I'm saying you guys were good. You guys were asking questions already. Uh, I like that. So, but lenses, this definitely is a situation where the lenses count. I'm just gonna go through this. VC will help you out or image stabilization for Tamron. It's called vibration compensation, especially when you're doing low light situations with longer lenses. This is shot at 600 millimeters, handheld, at 1 60th of a second. Um, and the reason why it's handheld is because we were driving and we pulled over quickly because the light was reflecting off the water and just didn't have time to pull out all the equipment, grabbed my camera gear and started firing. 1 60th of a second, so image stabilization helps a ton. The faster that shutter speed goes, it becomes neg negligible. There we go, after a full day of speaking, still can kind of say it. Um, when you're up at one two thousandth of a second, it's really not doing anything anymore. So you can turn it off what you want, but it's not harmful just to keep it on because you never know when you may go to that slower shutter speed and forget to turn it back on. So only time I would turn it off is I, if I am dead still on a tripod and no, I'm not moving the camera at all. Because if you keep it on a camera when it's dead still, it doesn't see any movement and guess what it may create its own so outside of that situation i just keep it on and let it go ultrasonic silent drives we got this guy again that is the focusing motor look for lenses that have very fast ultrasonic motors in them or a, a, a fast motor of some sort in it that helps capture because the faster that focusing motor is the, the more images you're going to be able to capture sharp now, when it comes to lenses, it's all about focal length. I don't know how many times people have come to me and said, I'm taking out, I took out my 70 to 300 millimeter and it just wasn't long enough or my 18 to 400 and I missed it by just that much. That is a very, very true statement when people come to me with that because this is a great example of showing what focal length to do. This is in the Everglades down in Florida and you can see this guy kind of way off in the distance and he's a, he's a pretty good distance away. 150 millimeters, 250 millimeters and what a lot of people have, 300 millimeters, still really small in the, fo in the, uh, in the viewfinder. 400 millimeters. 500 millimeters and even 600 millimeters. Now he's getting closer, but guess what? Because he was so far away, to me, he's still a little far. I don't want to fill the frame with him because I really, I got this kind of cool tree to the left here. So I added a teleconverter and with the 150 to 600, because it's a variable aperture, I would not use anything more than a 1.4x teleconverter unless you're okay going into manual focus. With the 1.4, the camera will, and lens will still autofocus really fine. When you go to 2x, you're losing a ton of light. And most cameras are F8 cameras. That means if, if when you double that aperture and it equals F8, it can still autofocus. If it starts going above it, then you start losing it. But here, a 1.4 is just fine. I'm going up to 845 millimeters now and it fills the frame. So longer is better when it comes to birding photography for sure. If you have something that goes up to 600 or if you don't, uh, 
Johnson Photo is more than happy to show you our 150 to 600 and Tele, which will help you out a ton. We got Tri those. We got them in stock. There you go. <laughs> Including gimbals, monopods, tripods, you name it. There you go. Awesome. Uh, tripods, monopods, and gimbal heads. Like I said, this is a prime example where my gimbal head on a tripod helped out a ton. We had fly, uh, groups of the sandhill cranes coming in from left to right, left to right, left to right, because they land due to what direction the wind's coming. And this particular group came in in this formation, and I'm firing away, I think it must have been 30 shots in a row. And having it on that gimbal head just allowed me every single swarm without getting tired and by precisely moving along with them helped out a ton, keeping them within the frame. And the reason why I picked this particular image, and this is ultimately the one out of, I'm going to say a couple of hundred in this case that I truly like, is the positioning of all the birds. It, they create this really nice arch, and all the birds are in kind of a different wing formation to almost landing just about there, getting ready to be almost there, still gliding along. This goofy guy is landing even though he's the highest in the sky. But not just that. When I look at my images, I look at everything in my images, including the background. It's not just the birds. These guys, these, these five that I'm concentrating, it's those four others in the background that I'm looking at as well. So all within the other groups and not really intersecting too badly into them to be distracting. Like these two are nicely within that curve. These two are nicely within that curve. So it all works together. Like if his body was overlapping and one of the frames it is, into here, because the tones are very close, it just doesn't look quite right. So, you know, I look that far into my images to kind of dissect what works well and what doesn't. Handheld here, definitely shoot handheld, especially when there's a lot of movement going on. These two guys were flying around, gliding around, looking for a place to land, so handheld worked out perfectly for me. Always do your research and understand their habits. <coughs> Excuse me. Santa Hill cranes are seasonal, uh, especially when they come in in, uh, in flocks. Here, it's November. They, 10 to 20, 30,000 come in in Bastel Apache. I think it was around March when we went to Kearney, Nebraska. If you want to see a mass amount of sandhill cranes, Kearney, Nebraska, I believe it was March, 490,000 were spotted in one week there. So that is definitely a migration spot and understanding that and knowing when to go there, knowing when they take off knowing when they land and where they land. These sandhill cranes down the Basel Apache tend to land in the afternoon at sunset in the ponds. Why? Because there's coyotes there and the coyotes don't like going into the pond. So they know that's the safest place to go. The cornfields aren't. The cornfields, they're going to get attacked. So understand their habits. Also, when do they take off? In the case of a sandhill crane, the first time I we went to shoot them, it was very frustrating trying to get them, get ones that were taking off because I didn't understand that they very slowly lean into the wind just before they're about to take off. And I would be looking at all of them. You know, you have a thousand in a lake and you're just like looking around, looking around, and there'll be three leaning. And you're like, oh, what's up with those two? And next thing you know, they take off they lean into the wind and then they take off. So look for the sandhill cranes that are starting to lean. You know within a couple of minutes, they're gonna take off. So learning the habits are gonna increase your ability to, to get those images. Like I said, practice, practice, practice. Use what's available to you. Florida, you're fortunate enough that you have tons and tons of migra migratory birds there. And even if you're not from Florida listening in on here, there's probably a local area that has migratory birds. But if you don't, go to a local sanctuary, go to a local zoo just to practice with those longer lenses because it's very, very unique shooting with them. I got a, hey, again, I got a question about the 150 to 600. Okay. Do you use the uh, vibration control one, two, or three, and why? Ah, great. Yeah, great, great, <laughs> great question. So on the 150 to 600 for Tamron, there's the three different VC modes. 
one is basically for everything. You have a still subject like this, uh, this uh, puffin. You have a moving subject and a bird in flight. You can go back and forth quickly. If you're moving back and forth quickly with them, you can do whatever. That will do it. Uh, one will handle that. But if you're specifically doing birds in flight or something moving, uh, a sports action where somebody's running for a touchdown, left to right movement or right to left movement, panning movement, bird in flight, a cheetah running in a field, something like that, put it on two, uh, BC number two mode, because that's what it's designed for. It's designed for that movement as you're, you're panning a lot long, and it'll just work a little bit better. Number three, is for a lower light. When you're hand holding in lower light, it'll give you just a little bit more VC action, I'll call it, in the sense that it'll, it'll allow you to hand hold at a slower shutter speed. And why? Because right as you press that shutter release to, to make the shutter go off, then the VC activates. On the other two mode, you'll notice when you're looking through that viewfinder, you slightly depress that VC to focus, you'll see this movement, lock and mode movement. On the first two modes, it's when you're going to focus and locking it in. The second, on uh, number three, it happens right as you hit that shutter, which allows it to, to have a little bit more action behind it so you can hand hold at a slightly slower shutter speed. So it's, you know, two is for panning, one's for everything, three is for lower light. So. Hey, uh, they, they, they're asking about, uh, or I should say one person, Jan's asking about, uh, what's your favorite gimbal? What's or, my favorite gimbal? One that does, uh, or one that does 360 rotation and is not heavy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not heavy. No, no, no. <laughs> um, again, this, I would go to Johnson Photo because it depends on your equipment. If you're not using a, if you're using a 100 to 400, maybe you can get away with a slightly smaller one, one that you don't have to worry about that's a little bit more robust. If you're using a 150 to 600, you might need one that's a little, got a little bit more beef to it, you know, just because of weight and size uh, of the the equipment you're using. But I'm sure they got, there's so many out there now. Um, yeah, we got like three or four gimbals basically yeah. in the store, you know, or mostly in stock. If you want, you can take a look and stop by. Uh, we got between ProMaster, Enduro, Gitsu, you know, we got a few of them to choose from. Yeah, there you go. They're, they're all great. So you know, you'll find one that'll be perfect for you. So, but practice, practice, practice. This guy, I will admit, uh, I went out nine hours on a boat uh, to shoot in Alaska, and it was whales. You know, we got whales had some seals and otters and some great glacier shots, but I specifically wanted a puffin. The closest puffin came within maybe a half a mile of the boat. And then you, if you ever seen a puffin, they're not very big. So a half a mile away, I could have had a thousand millimeter lens, still wouldn't have been long enough. As Soon as I got off the boat, I went to the Seward Aquarium, I got my puffin shot. So I even go to zoos to get the images that I want. So it's perfectly fine. They're a great bird. You know, how could I wanted one? That's the way I got it. So practice, 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 and use your local areas to do so. It's a numbers game, so shoot a lot. I mean, the conditions weren't great here with this swan, but I still, the sequence of him taking off, if you just shoot three or four images of him taking off, you might miss the one that's really the one you like the best and this in the sequence of maybe 20 uh it was okay but i like this one just because of those wings tipping that water just glazing right across it so shoot a lot birds are tough <coughs> so many times you're gonna have images that you clip a wing you clip a tail you clip a beak you get a half a bird um i can't even tell you how many total bird images i have and the ratio that are keepers. You say 2,000 images and I get 20 to 25 keepers that I like. I am perfectly fine with that. Um, there's no need to think you have to get half or three quarters of the image is good. If you're thinking that, you're gonna get yourself frustrated. You know, as long as you get a good number that you're just like, wow, that's a great image, that's, that, that should be grat uh, gratification enough. Did I hear you, Dono? I yeah, I got I got a couple questions, but I think one I I, I might know the answer. He's asking if a uh, guy is asking about uh, the eighteen to four, about using a gimbal for it. 
my personal preference, and I wouldn't necessarily use that for a gimbal. It's more of a handheld all in one. Right. Sure, could you? Sure. Do you need to? There's, I think there's enough handheld with the VR built into it to help out with yeah. most of that stuff. Uh, Marcia had, had another question, though, about the VR. Um, you're um, using it on the tri the 150 to 600. Sh huh? Should she turn it on or should she turn it off? If you're on a gimbal head, you can – if you're on a gimbal head and moving about, you can leave it on. That's perfectly fine. If you're shooting at one two thousandth of a second, it's really not going to do anything anyway. But like I said, for safety's sake, if you're going to move to a slower shutter speed and do something, maybe you want to leave it on. If you're on a gimbal head but completely locked down so there's no movement, then I would definitely turn it off. If you're on a ball head and completely locked down with any movement, turn it off. If you're on a monopod with slower shutter speeds and stuff, keep it on because no matter how steady you think you're on a monopod, there's still some movement there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And I got. I guess it's a general question. She's asked. Janet's asking if you delete your images that you don't use. I don't don't delete anything, but she wants to start. <laughs> <laughs> I don't delete anything. Um, and the reasoning, unless it's just a complete disaster of an image, like you, you know, you got a white frame or a black frame or nothing in focus at all, I'll throw those out. But if something is slightly soft or not exactly perfect, I still keep it. Because there's so many creative things you can do in photography now with the computer, like you can make it uh, an oil color, uh, oil painting type of look to it where it has that oil streaks and stuff in it you don't need a perfectly sharp image for that if if you turn it to something like that or you you make it into more of a watercolor look you don't need a perfectly sharp image for that so it depends on where and how creative or how far you want to go with your images and that's why i generally don't and i started with film years and years ago and i have um you know uh, drawers and drawers of film that stuff took up space physical space I have on my uh, desk right now, I have nine hard drives that take up an area maybe like that. So space is relative to me. So that's why I don't worry about keeping 99% of my images because I'm more than happy having nine hard drives uh, than nine, three tall you know, filing cabinets of, of film. So um, that's why, you know, keep it. You never know what you might do with it. So, um, but don't be afraid to shoot. Uh, don't think, oh my God, I'm up to 2000 images. This is going to be dreadful to edit. It's actually easier to edit than you think because you go through and you know right away, it's just like, okay, half a wing, half a beak, Boom, there it is. No good, no good, no. You'll go through them relatively quickly just because uh, of what it is. Shooting a lot here. This little guy, this spoonbill, was in the Vera Wetlands as well. And I'll admit, I shot probably 200 images of him over 15 minutes because he wasn't that active, but he was just an active. He was turning his head and all of a sudden not in good light and turning his head in good light and bobbing down and foot up, down, whatever. And I stuck with him for about, you know, a little while. And he dunked his beak in, and I'm shooting straight through as he dunks his beak in, and boom. I knew it right then when I, I just looked at him, like, wait a second, I think I got it. I got that little droplet of water. And that's what I mean. Sometimes the little details of something, he's looking in a good direction, so the side of his face is really nice lit. I'm not getting a little peek of an eye on the other side, so that's kind of nice. And he's got the leg up, you know, so overall it kind of worked out for me. Did I keep shooting? Sure. I shot for another couple of minutes, probably shot off another 30, 40 images, just in case he might do something a little bit more interesting or take off or whatever. But when you do get that image that you, you're like, oh, wow, that, that's a keeper, keep shooting. You never know. You might get more. So that's why the frames do add up when you're doing this. Look for the light. Let me see where I am. Four o'clock. Yep. Uh, going a little long. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, look for the light because afternoon and morning light definitely make up a big chunk of, of the good images because you go from this and then suddenly the sun sets much more dull of an image. So definitely look at the light, 
uh, better light will help you out. Those early morning, late afternoons, no matter how many times you hear it, you got to get up early and stay late into the afternoon. There's a reason for it. Uh, the images, that warm light definitely makes it help look better. Here again, these sandhill cranes and that late afternoon light, you may have to bump up that ISO because it's getting darker. It's, it is getting darker to your eyes to get that proper exposure. But you know, having all these reeds turn that golden color just makes it such a better image than midday white, white light and harsh, harsh light. You know? But don't, don't be afraid to turn your camera towards the light source, the sun here, especially if you're getting a good sunset and create some silhouettes. No matter how goofy they look when they're landing here, they look like missiles going through the sky. They are pretty graceful flyers when they're just going straight ahead. So shoot some silhouettes of those birds too, because you can get some really nice images. Hey Ken, Chief, yep. sorry, sorry, another question. They were kind of, uh, somebody was curious about the, what kind of software to use to sort out the good ones. You know, I've, um, I've heard of I've heard of mechanic, but you know, it's whatever. I don't. I use Lightroom. That's basically what I do. Yeah, photo mechanics fine. There's a couple of other things that you can use, but to edit quickly, Lightroom in the sense that to go through and look at what numbers are what. I'm been using Photoshop. 26 27 years now so i'm still an old school photoshop guy when it actually comes to editing editing but to filter through and to do my final edits of which ones i want to keep it's lightroom just because it's so easy to use that way it's, yeah. it's great for that all right oh so keep those eyes sharp like i said when you take an image of an animal of a person whatever it may be that has eyes to have your viewer keep you know interest in your image and focus on something keep the eyes sharp especially when you have a night heron like this i believe this was apalachicola with these demonic red eyes it's such a cool eye you know you got this dark blue and white bird with this spot red eyes that really i mean you're because his eyes sharp chances are your eyes as the viewer went straight to his as well and that's what you want to do with these kind of images Compo composition movement and direction go through these you can think about the rule of thirds as well breaking up your frame into thirds my horizon on the lower lower third these guys on the top third also think about movement in the sense of it's not much but it's a little different from the back of his leg on the right here to the edge of the frame is less than the direction that they're moving the tip of his beak to here the direction they're moving, try to leave a little bit of breathing room because it looks better for the viewer. And again, think about uh, the rule of thirds if you can. In this case, he, this guy, though, he was dead center in the middle of frame. His head was dead center in the middle of frame. This is another shot of one taken off. And this is where editing <laughs> becomes your best friend. You know, slightly editing, taking a little bit off the right side and a little bit off the bottom, editing that way, cutting my frame just a little bit so it moves him down in the frame. What I do when I shoot birds in flight, I tend to give a little bit more breathing room than is ultimately necessary in the sense that I don't try to get the exact crop I'm looking for because I found I tend to clip wings a little bit just because the way birds move sometimes are you know not predictable so I give a little don't give a ton don't make them really tiny in the frame so you have to crop in close just give a little bit of breathing room whatever you're comfortable with and then edit it later so you get that rule of thirds better bringing his head down a little bit maybe slightly off to the right but ultimately he's flying into that frame that way. Um, he's not right at this edge over here and not dead center. So don't be afraid to edit left, right, bottom, top, whatever it might be. Then again, going to that lower light, uh, there are gonna be conditions out there. Uh, we all get them. <laughs> I get them more often than not where they're just not ideal. A heavy set of clouds came in just before sunrise. It should have been much brighter than this. I was, no matter what I did, uh, comfortably bumping up my ISO, opening my aperture, just couldn't quite get shutter speeds to freeze these guys as well as I would like to. So I went the opposite direction. I purposely slowed down my shutter speed to about a tenth of a second in this case. And what did that do is as I'm panning and firing at a tenth of a second, 
you're getting multiple different types of blur here. You're getting motion blur from them flapping their wings. But you're also getting motion blur of me moving the camera. So the background, the mid-ground, the, the foreground are all much more blurry than they would normally be because I'm panning and shooting at a slow shutter speed at the same time. Fortunately for me, no matter how goofy these guys, for the most part, you can see a few, most of them can keep their heads pretty still while flying. So that's what kind of made it. If their heads were really soft too, maybe it wouldn't have been quite as nice. I don't mind these guys being out of focus, but as long as the majority of them, their heads are pretty sharp. What I like about this too is printing. This one I purposely slightly desaturated. Didn't have to do too much because there wasn't much saturation here because it was such dull light. I just slightly desaturated a little bit more and combination of that blur, it now kind of looks like a watercolor painting. And I print it on a fiber-based texture paper and then it really looks like a watercolor painting. So you always think, think beyond the photo and maybe make not look like a photo. That can help work as well. So do your research. Check the web for places to photograph. I'm sure there's got to be something, even if it's a zoo or something, or a small sanctuary for birds close by, and you can practice and get out there. But when you go, even on vacation, look, is there a migration going on? Is there something happening where I'm going? And also, you know, uh, images taken by other photographers. The, the snow geese shot, the very slow shutter speed, was influenced by another photographer. It had impact 15, 20 years later on me that I still remember it when I was sitting there. Check sunrise and su sunset times because birds are active early, later afternoons. They, they move at certain times as well. And weather conditions can help you know if there's going to be birds or not. You know, if a storm's coming in and the pressure front's coming in, it may be pushing those birds out as well. So check all these things before going out and shooting, and it'll definitely increase your uh, ability to capture the images you want. If you have any more questions for me outside of this presentation, something hits you later on, or you uh, talk about a place I went to further, feel free to contact me. You can contact me anytime. I do go out in the field a lot, so it may be here and there, take a day or two to get back to you, but I'll get back to you. So, all hey, right. Hey, Ken, you got two more questions for you, if all you don't right. mind. No problem. Uh, we had somebody ask, what's your favorite spot to shoot birds on the East Coast? I'm assuming with a camera, not with a, not with a shotgun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I've really come to, on the East Coast, love Florida for that, because you have so many birds in so many locations. West Coast, South, East Coast, the Panhandle. There's, I mean, Apalachicola for bald eagles and ospreys is amazing. Yeah. Uh, for spoonbills, the Vera wetlands, and other places – uh, Everglades, it's just loaded with areas. But for birds of prey, believe it or not, Cape May in the fall, October, the amount of birds of prey they get there are fantastic. It's just stunning. So it, yeah. there's tons of places. Yeah. And so uh, I think we'll hopefully got one more, two, one, two more questions just popped up. Uh, so if you got enough, you still got time? Yeah, I got time. Sure, sure. Uh, when slow panning, uh, VC on, off, or mixed? I'll, I'll keep it in that two mode. I'll keep it on right. because I am moving the camera and I am, uh, you know, panning with it. But if you're using the 150 to 600, still keep it in that two mode, number two mode. So, uh, Ken, when you shoot raw, how are you getting into it into Lightroom? My, my raws are not recognized. What is your middle man? I, Great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm um, are they using the lighter version of Lightroom? I I'm thinking to... that's what it is. It's probably the older version because any of the current version, I can't sure. think of there's any on no raw file that Lightroom can't read at this time. Right. Right. Yeah. I would think, I don't think any cameras come out. Yeah. The old Lightroom. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Janet, you'll have to upgrade yeah. your Lightroom. Unfortunately. Lightroom. I, th I know there's two versions of Lightroom now. You got the full version and the lighter version, which confused. Uh, not sure why they did that, but um, got a little confusing there for a while. Uh, but I think both of them do it. So I think, like you said, Donna, it's the it's an older version that just didn't. Yeah. Well, listen. Uh, I know in case there's any more questions, you could, like you said, you can see Ken's contact yeah. information right there. By all means, reach out to him. 
take a look and always have, don't forget to share some of this stuff about Ken on Facebook and Instagram. I'm sure he, he, he doesn't mind when people share his stuff on social media. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. We're power to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, um, I mean, I can't thank you all enough for coming on here. And, and Ken and, and Jeff, thank you so much for, for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. I hope everyone has a chance to stop by Johnson Photo Imaging between now and then. We have, we got most of the stuff here. We got, like I said, we got the gimbals, tripods, even Tamron lenses, amazingly enough, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, there is a Tamron 150 600 lens that works on a Sony A7 III. Uh, you usually you'll have to get the, the Canon adapter for that, but yeah. But yes. Uh, but like I said, there's some interesting glass that's rolling out from Tamron. It's designed specifically for the Sony FE mount system. So oh, yeah. keep, 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 keep your eyes peeled. I was fortunate enough to use that 28 to 200. It's, yeah. it's you use it on an a7 three or something like that. A uh, seven R three. Yeah. yeah. I haven't gotten to the four yet. Um, I haven't found the need, but I'll probably eventually. So. <laughs> And of course, Glidden is always asking the, the ultimate question, any news on our mount lenses? I think he asked this last time. <laughs> I think the answer is before. Uh, just, just stay tuned. <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> uh, cool. no, great, great. Thanks for having me again. Uh, great audience. Yeah, um, I'm looking to... No problem. I'm looking forward to hearing from Jared and from Jill, Jillian later yeah. on. So this will be cool. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Ken. Thanks, Tamara. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, guys. All right. Thanks, uh, everybody for it, attending. No, no problem. If there's any more questions, like I said, contact Ken directly, or you can message uh, the store or just call the store and stop in. We'll be glad to help you out.